sermon schedule, but we really need to actually address some of these things. Obviously, in a weekend seminar like this, you're not going to be able to address all of the things. You have to have an active, um, assertive health and temperance department or club in the church that keeps these things before the eyes of the people. And, and it, these roots here, um, it's where those seeds of disease are sown. So let's move on. What, what do you think? Uh, the body has at least 10 systems in it, depending on how they're all divided. Which of these is the most important system in your body? Hmm? Nervous system. The brain is pretty important. What, what's another one that you think is in the top three? So, yep, the heart. If your heart's not working good, you've got, you've got issues. Uh, but I would, this, is, this might catch you off guard. I, I think that I'd have to put digestive pretty high on the list. Brother Ski, you're, you're extreme. You're a fanatic. Okay, well, hold on. Give me just a moment here. How, why would I do that? Because whatever the Bible talks about the most, that's what God thinks is most important. And if you go in the Bible and you start, you start um, looking at what the Bible says, the Bible has the most to say about what we eat and how we actually eat. Among all the laws of health, it has the most to say about it. So if God thinks it's important, then what should we think? Better take a good look at that. The other thing that lets me know that it's important is that, um, that, that molecule for molecule, the, the most powerful impact that your environment has on you is the five or six pounds, some of you, 10 pounds, of food that you eat every day. And that, I mean, right now, you're breathing air into your lungs, and that's a lot of molecules. Right now, you did the, the clothes that you have, some of the molecules of those polyester fibers or cotton or silk fibers is getting into your skin. But your most powerful contact with the environment is the one to five pounds of food that you eat, which actually becomes part of the nutrients. So your environmental, its, it's strongest impact on you is what you eat every day. And so that lets us know that that digestive system is pretty important. And it's important to look at the quality of what you put in your mouth. And because, you know, you, if you're an adult, you pick your own clothes. You dress, your, your clothing actually is a, is a externalization of, of your choices and, and what you like. And um, if you have reasonable means and access to uh, different stores, you can actually choose the colors and the style. And it's the same thing with your food. I mean, when we go to the grocery store and we got $60 in our, in our little skinny wallet there, we actually can make a choice of what we put in that basket. And that says a lot about who we are. Now, appetite is something that the devil is continually stirring up and in, in using as um, pressure for us to do the wrong thing. And in Council of Diet and Foods on page 150, it actually says, Satan is constantly on the alert to bring the race fully under his control. His, what's the next phrase? Hold on man is through the appetite. His strong, if Satan has hold to you, his strongest grip on you is through that, that appetite to eat certain things. It is extremely powerful and it has made weight loss a multi-billion dollar industry. So let's look at what the Bible emphasizes that we should eat. Okay, for you Bible scholars, what did God say in Genesis 129 that we should eat? Okay, I'm hearing the correct answer out there. Here it is, Genesis 129. I've given you the herb-bearing seed. By the way, that's grains. It's upon the face of the palm of the earth. And every tree in the which is the what? of a tree yielding seed. And so, and it says, to you, in the King James Version, shall it be for meat, or New King James, to you it shall be for food. And the fruit of an uh, apple tree is apples, the fruit of a cashew tree is cashews. And so nuts are part of the fruit kingdom. And so the thing that God gave to Adam and Eve at the very beginning to eat was fruits, nuts, and grains. Here it is in um, 
I, I like to say that the great chemist in the sky ordained that fruits, nuts, and grains should supply all of the elements. All of the elements. In Council of Diet and Foods on page 380, it says again and again, I've been shown that God is trying to lead us back. What's the next three words? Oh, those are so important. Step by step to his original design. That man should subsist upon, what's the last phrase there in white? I'm trying to make you read. The more you read, the more you actually retain. So it says that God's trying to lead us back step by step. He's not coming in and saying, okay, I want you to have a sugarless, saltless, oilless cake <laughs> today. Give up all your pepperoni pizza, and today, you're going to be vegan today, and it's going to be no sugar, no salt, no oil. No, that's not his plan. He's trying to lead us back. How does it say? Step by step. By step. And that we should eventually get to the point where we're subsisting, we're living off of. What does the last phrase say? Now, I have a question for you. Have you ever seen a field like this? Have you ever seen a, a veggie burger field? Have you? I was at a church. I think I haven't. No, you haven't. You haven't. So it said the natural products of the earth. So it's not really talking about sandwiches, really. It's not. Matter of fact, Council of Foods 460 says that the food that God gave to Adam and Eve in his sinless state is the food that he's trying to give to us for us to regain. So this is a very important idea. It's that your, what you eat is related to your spiritual condition. And in the Bible, you will find that God changed the dietary requirements as man's spiritual condition changed. And then as man tries to regain the original spiritual condition, that man will necessarily have to also change his dietary requirements again to ascend the other side of the ladder. This explains why Jesus allowed his disciples to eat fish at that time, but at this time, it's probably not a good idea. Now, it says the natural products of the earth. Read this phrase for me. What does it say? Okay. That means that it's something that just grows in nature. And um, by the way, the only living part are the seeds. And God intends that we eat seeds. You buying watermelons that are seedless, grapes that are seedless, that's actually a bad thing. You really should be eating watermelon that has seeds in it and eat a few of those seeds because the life is in the seed. And eat some grapes and crunch on a few of the of the of the grape seeds. Grape seeds actually have elements in them that kill things. And God, eat a little bit of apple seeds. We always cut the core out, but eat a couple of apple seeds because apple seeds have a trace little bit of cyanide and it kills cancer cells. And God wants us to get food in its natural state. Some of you, I could take your lunch yesterday, bury it in the ground, water it every day, and nothing would ever grow. Because nothing in your lunch was alive. But some of you, if I buried your lunch, I'd have a forest growing because you guys are just eating sprouts and sesame seeds and all kinds of things. And that's what we need to be getting back to the natural products of the earth. Fruit and natural food as it grows is, was so valuable that when the children of Israel went into combat in Bible times and they were destroying nations, God told them when they were making war that it says, thou shalt, what does it say here, in yellow? The trees, talking about fruit trees, thereof by forcing an axe against them, for thou mayest eat of them. It says, thou shalt not cut them down. I, I love this expression. For the tree of the field is man's life to employ it. What does it say in pink? To employ, what does it say there in pink? Employ it when? It says, look, when you go there and you're warring against them, don't cut the fruit trees down. Eat the fruit. It'll give you strength to war more against your enemies. That's what's making them strong, is eating these natural products of the earth. That's Deuteronomy chapter 20. Question number two. After man sinned, this, 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 this slide program has 17 questions. We're going to do three, okay? So, so hold on. I'll let, you, I'll let you out on time. After man sinned, what changes were made in man's diet? You Bible scholars? What did God add? Ding, ding, ding. That is correct. Genesis 3, verse 18. He added vegetables and something else. Thorns also and thistles was after sin, shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat. Here it is, the herb of the field. He didn't say the herb-bearing seed. He says the herb of the field, 
And many Bible scholars believe he's talking about the greens that grow in the field, the vegetables. He also said, in the sweat of what? In the sweat of thy face. That's when you're really exerting. When you first start working out, you got you sweat under your arms. You got to really be moving, or it has to be pretty hot outside when you start sweating in your face. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat what? Till you return to the dust. By the way, bread is a cooked food in the Bible. It was baked or it was fried. There are examples. And so that means that after sin, God intends for us to eat some cooked food. Say amen. amen. There are people that will come along and say, ah, you should be 100% raw. That is not correct. If you were free from sin, you could be 100% raw. But because we're all sinners saved by grace, we need to keep, keep our strength up. We got to have some vegetables and some cooked Food, praise God for the bread. Now, but if you eat all cooked food and nothing raw, that's a bad thing. You've gone to the extreme because inspiration says we're going step by step to his original design that man should eat what grows out there in nature. Now, when Adam and Eve were first created, their digestion and their food were what? The Bible doesn't use that language. The Bible says that God made it and God said that it was very good. When God does something and he says what I did was very good, that means in plain English, it was perfect. That's what that means. Now, that's a very deep idea. I believe that in the beginning, because the food was perfect and their digestion was perfect, there was no waste that came out of them. I don't believe that, I'm not, no, don't, don't quote me on this, but I don't believe Adam and Eve were going through the garden, um, messing up the garden. I believe that because the food was perfect and their digestion perfect before sin, nothing came out. And um, they were just having a wonderful time in the Garden of Eden, swimming in the, in the river, climbing the, the grass and flower-covered hills and everything. And then after sin, they had another revelation. For the first time in their experience, now waste is now coming out of their body. How do we know that? Because the Bible says that sin brought a change to nature. It said that it would bring forth, what did it say? It begins with TH. Thorns and thistles. And their bodies became weakened. Their digestion was not, no longer perfect. And so God added some new things to their diet to keep their strength up. And what did he add? What two things? Vegetables and cooked grains. Brothers and sisters, we need to be eating fruits, nuts, vegetables, cooked grains, and these veggies. Why did God say that they should eat those things? It's because they are higher in what? Vegetables and cooked grains are higher in minerals than most fruits. There are some fruits that are high in minerals. Figs, plums, um, prunes, dates are very high in iron and magnesium and some minerals, and we should be eating those fruits also. But the vegetables, just naturally, a broad spectrum of them are very high in minerals. Um, for iron, leafy green vegetables, kale, beans, tofu, figs, dates, here it is. For calcium, almonds, what's the next one? Leafy vegetables, kale, spinach, tofu, soy milk, zinc, what does it say at the top? There it is again, pumpkin seeds, tofu, almonds. Those are things that are high in iron, calcium, and zinc. Why are minerals needed? Here's the, here's the punchline now. We'll go a little bit deeper. You need minerals for strength if you want to be a strong individual. Brother Skeet, you made that up. Watch this now, Romans 14, verse 2. One believes that he may eat all things. Another who is, read that for me, eateth what? because that will give him strength. Um, the book of nature also teaches this. The strongest land animal out there is the elephant. I don't know if you know or not that elephants eat quite a bit if they have access to it. And they eat between 220 and 440 pounds of vegetation. 30 to 60% of that is what? They're not climbing trees, getting those berries and bananas, for, you know, for their loved ones, they are eating grasses and they are strong. Um, gorillas are not eating a lot of fruit. They do eat fruit, but they're eating largely vegetation. 
you know that a gorilla can, they say he can bench press between 1,500 and 2,000 pounds. So if you um, are, should find a gorilla in uh, Pleasant Hill or right here in Crossville, um, don't try to just uh, use your little Volkswagen to put him up against the wall. He'll push that Volkswagen out of the way, okay? That's how strong he is. And he's not eating a lot of beef and uh, taking soy protein and all that. He's eating grasses and his strength is developed. Now, I have a question for you. Why don't farmers plow their fields with tigers? We're going to go a little bit deeper now. A little bit deeper now. Somebody answer that for me. At my church, we talk, so you have to talk because I'm in, this is my church today. Okay, where's, I'm, I'm the pastor. It's, I talked to him last night. He's like, oh, I wish I could be there. So I said, don't worry. We'll have a good time. Why don't people plow fields with tigers? Somebody. And do I, oh, no, tigers are pretty. They got. Someone said wild. Elaborate. Wild meaning. Are tigers strong? They're very strong. But the problem is their temperament. If you, if you put a plow on a tiger, he'll pull it about 10 paces, and then you better get out the way. Don't be walking behind that plow on your cell phone, okay? Because he doesn't have the temperament to, to labor slow and long all day long. And the reason is because of what tigers eat. Their food modifies their temperament. All the herbivore animals, except for one, have been domesticated. The horse, the ox, the camel, the burro have all been domesticated. The elephant have all been domesticated. The only one that hasn't been, they have never been able to domesticate is a zebra. And that's a whole other study in itself. And it's the reason that these have been domesticated it's, a, it's because of their high mineral green intake. It does something to their temperament. We're talking about what God said for us to eat. And what we're going to find out is that what God said to eat actually changes not only your body, it actually changes your, your mindset and your, and your temperament. They've done studies to show that attitude and behavior greatly improve when you increase what? It says depression, mood swings, and aggression may be ameliorated, means softened by supplementation with vitamins and minerals. Another study says um, uh, research shows on nutrition that deficiency, um, it says research on nutrition deficiency and aggressive behavior is beginning to get attention. Several studies reported that, what, is, what, what mineral is that? Iron. Iron deficiency is directly associated with aggressive behavior and conduct disorder. Similarly, what? Zinc deficiency has been linked to aggressive behavior in both animals and, and humans. It talks about antisocial and violent behavior. And the three big minerals, I want you to say this, is calcium, iron, and zinc. Say that. If you get deficient in calcium, iron, or zinc, it will change your behavior. It will change your temperament. In the public schools today, the children you have, some that are very aggressive. And it's because part of it is because of their minerally deficient diet. And you have others that are there passive and they're getting um, depressed and discouraged. Also, one of the traits is that minerally deficient diet. So when God said for us to eat the fruits, nuts, grains, cooked grains, and vegetables, he wasn't just thinking about your physical health. He's saying, listen, if you want to become who I want you to be, you need to eat what I'm asking you to eat. The largest study ever done, the largest study ever done on diet is this study here, the China study, that was done over a long period of time. It was commissioned by the, the premier who got cancer, and he said, I want you to... To, to conduct a study on every Chinese person in my empire. They didn't, they didn't make every Chinese person, but they, had, they did do a survey on hundreds of millions of Chinese people. It's, it's a study that's just so massive, it's, it's irrefutable, indisputable. That's how big it is. The other thing that makes it so hard to argue against is that the Chinese don't intermarry. They, um, they try not to intermarry. And so the genetic pool was largely the same. So you can't, you can just 
throw out this idea, oh, well, you know, well, genetics are all scrambled. No, that didn't, that didn't, that didn't bear. And what, and what they discovered in the big China study is that in some places of China, they had lots of cancer. In some places, they had no cancer. And they found out that where they had lots of cancers where people were eating a lot of animal-based foods. And in the study, they took equal parts of beef, pork, chicken, and whole milk, and they compared the nutritional value between the tomatoes, equal parts of tomatoes, spinach, lima beans, peas, and potatoes. Now, you would think that the, the beef, chicken, and pork is going is to really just clobber that, that lima beans and peas, but you would be wrong. What the study showed is that the plant-based food had how much cholesterol? Zero. That's a good thing, because cholesterol, eating it is a bad thing. It had, it had one-ninth of the fat. That's a good thing. You, your body doesn't want a lot of oil in it. The protein, shockingly, was almost the same. People say vegetarians are de protein deficient. That is not true. The, the beta-carotene, the vitamin A, thousands of times more in the plant-based. Dietary fiber, there's no fiber in pork, chicken, and milk. Lots of fiber. Vitamin C, it's 293 to 4. Folate, vitamin E, 20 times. Iron, 10 times as much. Magnesium, 11 times as much. Calcium, twice as much. There's a lot of nutrition. What's the point of the story? You need to eat your tomatoes, potatoes, peas, lima beans, and spinach. Amen? We need to eat that every day because that food is super high in all the things. If you can't get it in, throw it in a little limeade and juice it and drink a little bit of it, just two or three inches every day. Just hit it. Throw a little carrot juice, put a little beet in there. Don't put a lot of beet, just a little bit of beet, quarter of a beet. A beet is so powerful. You start putting big beets in there, your, your tummy's going to protest against that because beet is very powerful, but if you start drinking some of these things and start flooding your bodies with nutrients, your, your mind and your temperament in your body will be a different body. So God gave them those vegetables and cooked grains to build what? To build strength. Why is strength needed? Why do you need strength? When you get to be 80 years old, you'll be saying strength is important. You'll say it then, but we should say it now at 20 years old or at 30 or 40 years old. We should be the strongest 40-year-old woman that walks in Piggly Wiggly. When you walk in there, you should be the strongest woman in there because you're living in a way to build your strength. Why is strength important? Look at this. This is Christ's object lesson. I want you to read the words that are capitalized. Anything that enfeebles the mind and makes it of discriminating between right and wrong. We become, what does it say? Of choosing the good and have to do that which we know to be right. Stop. Know what this says? Anything you do that, that weakens you just a little bit, it makes you less able to even know the difference between right and wrong. If you know what's right, you have less ability to choose the right. And if you choose it, you have less strength of will to do it. So do you need to be strong if you want to do the right thing? Amen. We need to build our strength and say, you know what? God, you've given me this body. I want to take care of it and make it as strong as we can. If fruits, nuts, and vegetables and cooked grains were such a blessing, here's a good question. Why did God allow man to eat meat? Who can answer that for us? You Bible students. Because he created us a free agency. Okay. Well, let's see. If we, let the Bible answer that for us. What were the spiritual conditions of society during the time when man was allowed to eat meat? And what did God say that he would do? Here it is. And God saw that the greatness of man was great. And that is Every imagination of his thoughts on his heart were only evil continually. And this is what the Lord said in verse 7. He said, I will destroy man. We go over to the next verse, uh, the couple of verses up above. He said, my spirit will not always strive. He says, his days shall be how long? 
120. God says, I'm going to shorten his life because of the way he's living. I'm not going to give him so long to do so much evil. That is why God allowed them to eat meat. People say, oh, God allowed them to eat meat because there was nothing else on the ark. Well, what did the animals eat for 120 days? Were they eating each other? They couldn't have been eating each other because if they ate each other, then, then the purpose of putting them on the ark would have been defeated if in the end all you have is one big elephant. <laughs> I've mean, eaten everything else on the ark. That, that wasn't God's plan. God was trying to preserve the animals. And so, so, so Noah took on the ark. He took plant life and all, enough plant life for the eight human beings and all the animals. So, so, so they didn't have to eat the animals. The reason that God said, I'm going to allow you to eat meat is because he said, because of how you're living, your years are only going to be 120. We talked about this in our last slide program. How, how old was Noah when he died? So if God told you who lives 80 years old that you were only going to live to be 20, because Noah was living 950 and he says, your years are going to be 120. I'm going to cut you from 950 to 120. That would be like bad news. Imagine that. If you were born and you're only going to live to be 20, what would, that, what would that do to the way you live? What would, you, what would that do for your plans? What would that do for your long-term goals? What would you have to do differently? Anybody? <laughs> would have, what, would you, what would that do with your time that you have? You know, brothers and sisters, we're living in that time when we should be managing our time well. We as God's people, me, John Ski, I waste too much time. I'm a news junkie. I'm always reading, I read the South African newspaper. I shouldn't be reading the South African newspaper. I live in Indiana. I need to be about what God wants me to do. We need to be managing our time. And, and we know that, that when they began to eat meat, that their life was, was shortened. This is the text that says that man is to be 70 years old. Psalms 90, verse 10. The days of our years are no longer 120. There are three score years and ten. But watch this, what this Bible text is beautiful. The psalmist wrote this. And if by reason of what? They be what? Okay, stop. Know what that says? That's a powerful principle. It says that if you do certain things for strength, it will add to your life. And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. It doesn't add 10 years on the end between 80 and 90, where you're going to be around pushing your walker a little bit faster. What God does is he puts the 10 years right in early in your life. And when you're 40, it's like you're 30. It's when, when you're 60, it's like you're 40. And God, he expands the productive years. He says, by reason of what? If by reason of strength. And the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 that kings and princes should eat and do season for what? So there's something about your choices of eating that can actually give you more vitality, more energy, make you younger and make you live longer and more productive mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. Now, did God arbitrarily cut man off and shorten his life? Or were there certain biological and physiological actions working. Does God know everything? Yes. Did God know what would happen when man began to move away from plants and cooked grains and fruits and now eat lamb and venison and, and these clean meats, even with the blood out? Did God know what would happen? He did. He did, because there are certain things in meat that actually are really hard on the body. You know, your body needs cholesterol. But what you may not know is that your body produces cholesterol. It produces all of the cholesterol that you need. Cholesterol is incorporated in, in, the, in, the, in the membrane of every cell. Every cell has to have it. But cholesterol is a complicated molecule. Here's a, here's a, um, a chemical, um, what do they call this? Model of that molecule. See how many bonds that that has? It's so complicated, the body has a very difficult time breaking it down. So it's producing all the cholesterol it needs. And when you go and 
put dietary cholesterol in, the body can't process it. It, cannot, it has almost no capacity, almost no capacity to break down cholesterol. And so it says, I don't know what to do with all of this. So it starts putting it in the lining of your blood vessels. And that's a bad thing. It starts putting that cholesterol in the lining of your blood vessels because your liver's producing all that you need, but now you're adding dietary cholesterol. And that causes problems. And, and um, it causes a disease called atherosclerosis, you know. And, you know, the, the arteries get stiffer and they don't, they're less responsive and it makes the blood pressure go up as the little lumen, the hole gets smaller. And the funny thing is that when it starts to get clogged up, you have no symptoms. You're 40% clogged, you're 50% clogged. There's no symptoms. And then it gets 60% clogged and you may have a little bit of chest pain. And it's not really, it's not until it's, till your blood vessels are really clogged up. That's why they call it the silent killer. I have a friend that does ministry. I know him well. And just last month, he was 71 years old. He was cutting his lawn. This guy's vegan. He had a heart attack and died instantly. And when we heard all on the phone, I was surprised. This guy, he eats cleanly. He doesn't do any exercise. And he had this silent killer at work. And many times, the first symptom is a heart attack or a stroke, and that's not a good thing. This is an actual cross-section of a blood vessel that's been filled up with cholesterol. If that blood vessel goes to the brain, it's going to cause a stroke. A stroke is, to, it can be debilitating. It, if it's a minor stroke, you can recover. If it goes to the heart, you'll have a heart attack. If that blood vessel leads to your foot, you're going to have gangrene. Now, cholesterol is only found in what two things? Okay, how much cholesterol is there in milk? Anybody know? Eight ounces of milk, 28 milligrams. How much is in an egg? 250 per egg. And all of that cholesterol is in the yellow yolk. If you're going to eat eggs, take the yolk out and eat the album and the white part. Or just get a little bit of the yellow. Oh, but that's what the flavor is. Well, get a little bit of it. But that yellow yolk is very high and cholesterol. I have a friend lived in Wisconsin. He would eat between six and a dozen eggs a day. He was a dairy farmer, Sabbath keeper. He wasn't an Adventist. He was a Sabbath keeper. He died of cancer. He got a diagnosis of cancer, and in three weeks, he was dead. And um, it's that super high protein intake. Now, drink, drinking milk from animals is what? Would you do this? How many of you young people would do this? You, any of you? But the skates, you're crazy. I would never do that. Well, that, that's what you do when you get it out of a cup, essentially. I mean, you're not, you're not getting on your hands and knees, but you're, you're drinking the same thing. And, and brothers and sisters, there's no adult animal where the animal will allow the, the adult to suckle it. They'll push it away. It's only for babies. So if you're going to drink milk, you need to be drinking human milk. Hmm? Hmm. <laughs> and you need <laughs> to be under two years of age. That is correct. <laughs> now, it's hard to get off of milk, but the hardest thing to get off of cheese. is cheese. And there's a reason for that. By the way, it takes 10 pounds of milk to make one pound of cheese. I love this picture. This girl looks like she's out of her mind. Okay? <laughs> and the reason is that in milk, there's a protein that when it's not digested, that protein is called casein. When it's not completely digested, it makes an opiate called castle morphine. And that castle morphine, all cheese, because it's concentrated milk, it all has castle morphine. It's an opiate. It is an opiate. I think, I don't think I have it here, but you know, I had a picture. You ever seen a baby's face when they breastfeed? They're like in heaven. <laughs> it's like they're on drugs. And it's because they are. They're on a little trace amount of casomorphine. It calms the baby. God intended that it put the baby to sleep. It's a good thing when babies go to sleep. You ask these mothers, they're like, more, more queso, get that baby some queso. need some queso right now, casomorphine right now. But that's why we who, it's not only the texture that cheese puts in a burrito, 
But there's actually a chemical agency that it's like, you know what? I've had people that they've given up everything, but they still go back and dabble at the tree of knowledge and good and cheese. Okay? <laughs> so there are other problems with the meat that shortens man's life. You know, when lions kill their prey, they eat it immediately. They don't scavenge. You know that there are only certain animals that were designed to eat something that's been dead a long time. A vulture is one of them, but none of you want to look like a vulture, okay? They don't even have a cool look. Their look is crazy, okay? But vulture stomach acid is, what does it say here in yellow? Oh, I want you guys to read it. I want you guys to read it. It says 10 to 100 times stronger than human stomach. Their, their stomach acid can kill botulism, cholera, anthrax. They can eat anthrax and say, that was great. <laughs> you got any more? <laughs> That's what vultures can do. But you can't do that. If you eat anthrax, it will kill you. And you know, when meat, after it's been killed, it is teeming with bacteria. I don't have time. I took all the slides out. But you have a whole microbiome of bacteria. You have bacteria in your nose, your mouth, your digestive tract. You have bacteria on your skin. And it's a certain type of bacteria. And when you start eating a lot of other bacteria, it disrupts your microbiome. You have more bacteria than you have cells in your body. It's like a whole nother you is this bacteria that God intends to keep all of those in balance. And when you start putting cheese, which is high in bacteria, Anytime you eat cheese, you get a you know, white blood cell count immediately goes up, elevated. The body says, infection, 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 because it's a bunch of, cheese is just rotted milk. And, and the body says, this is a lot of bacteria I need to mobilize. And it's the same with eating meat. To destroy bacteria in meat, it needs to be heated how hot? For how long? So my question is, uh, how many of you cook your meat for two hours? None of us do. None of us do. Ordinary cooking will not destroy the bacteria, the pernicious uh, organisms in meat. Whenever you're eating meat, you're just eating quazillion bacteria, quazillion. Brother Ski, what are you talking about? Look, in fresh horse manure, there's 25 million bacteria per gram. In hamburger steak, what did it say there? It's three times this much bacteria. So. So if you're going to eat meat, cook it for a long time. A long, long time. Or don't eat it at all. Try something else. The other problem, so when God allowed them to eat meat, all of these things were, were conspiring to shorten man's life. He says, you, you want to eat this, huh? You, you want to eat this? Go ahead. You can eat it. But there's a cost that will be paid. And the reason that we have heart disease and cancer so high, it's because of those lifestyle choices. The other problem is fat. I know my time is, uh, I got about five, six minutes left. Um, when you eat a lot of fat, that fat goes into your blood and your blood becomes fatty. This is blood. I'm sorry, it's a blurry picture. This is someone's blood that was drawn and all that yellow you see, that's fat in the blood. That is a terrible thing. God didn't intend for you to have 25% of your, of your blood just yellow like that with fat. That is a bad thing. And there's many people right here in Crossville, they're walking up and down the street, and this is exactly what their blood looks like. And they walk up and down the street because of God's kindness and his goodness. They walk up and down the street for 40, 50 years like that. And then suddenly something, they say suddenly, but it's not really suddenly, but something bad comes of that. And the reason, you know, in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verses 11 and 12, it says that that sentence against the evil work is not meted speedily. It's God's, it's his patience. He says, you know what? I don't want you to reap. I'm going to postpone it as long as I can. But what are the reaping years? The 50s and 60s. Now, what's the problem with having so much oil in your blood? This is just one of the quick problems. I had to go quickly. Is that all of your red blood cells have a negative charge. You take a, a magnet, and you put the two negative poles together, they will repel. Put the two positive poles together, they will repel. Because all your red blood cells have a negative charge, they come down your bloodstream and they just, oh, excuse me, oh, pardon me. They just kind of just, they just, they don't even touch each other. They just keep going. And that's a good thing for your blood to go freely. 
but when you put oil in your diet that makes them stick. It makes them what? Stick together. An hour after a fatty meal, they're sticking. Four hours, six hours later, they're sticking together. And here's the most important graphic. How long does it take before the, the, they can tumble freely through the bloodstream? How long does it have to be? How many of you go 12 hours between meals? We do not. It's a fatty breakfast with our bacon and eggs fried and dripping in oil. And then at lunch, it's the, the big, juicy, chili sandwich. And then in the evening, it's another fatty. We are perpetually in blood sludging where our blood is sticking together. And it cannot take in the oxygen and discharge carbon dioxide freely. And we're just always short of breath because we have such greasy blood. There's other problems. Fat is particularly damaging to the female gender. Particularly damaging because fat affects the hormones profoundly and uh, the estrogen levels. Menarche, how do you pronounce that? Menarche? That's the, um, that's the first time that a girl has her cycle. And girls on a low-fat diet start their cycle at 16 years of age. Those on an oil-rich diet begin their cycle when? Age 12, 11, 10, their hormones have changed. Brothers and sisters, that's a bad thing. Because what goes with the change of hormone is a sex drive. The judgment of a 16-year-old girl is much superior to the judgment of a 11, 12-year-old girl. You don't want a 12-year-old girl with a sex drive. Um, menopause is, comes later, and it's more painful and heavier if you're on high fat. Much higher incidence of breast cancer. You know, in Japan, for, for in 1875, they had a very um, a plain and simple rice and grain and seaweed diet. And the average Japanese girl got her first cycle at 16 and a half years of age. But as they adopted the Western diet, about 100 years later, it's almost the same as America, and they have problems. There's other factors, there's social factors. When, when girls are watching on uh, media, these other young girls that are dressed like adults, they're only eight or nine years old, but they're dressed in the same clothes that adult women wear. They have makeup, they have high heels, they have lipstick, and they, and they hear all of those hypersexualized um, uh, lyrics in this music. All of those things combining with the biology of their hormone changing is the ramifications for society is great when we get off of God's plan. That's why the America and Western Europe is going down the tubes because we have, you, have, you have social and psychological and, and emotional factors affecting the home. There's no love in the home. There's no respect. It's, there's latchkey kids, and they're looking at all of this, and it's causing all types of problems. Um, the, I, my time is up, so I'm just going to just flip quickly through these last 15 slides, but there's other things that I want you to be thinking about today and say to yourself, Lord, is this what you would like for me to change? One of the big things is eating things that come out of cellophane, cardboard boxes, and cans. Processed food. That processed food is just what's coming us. We've got to eat things as they occur in nature. There's a big push now. What does it say there at the top? You know that now, um, you heard about this Beyond Burger? Heard about this? You know you got Kentucky Fried Chicken says, sells Beyond Chicken, and Burger King is selling the Beyond Whopper. And <clears throat> it's still processed food. It's not the way that God made it. And by the way, the reason that KFC and Burger King are selling it is only one reason. They are not interested in your blood vessels and your health at all. Know what the reason is? That burger is expensive. It, they say, you know what? We can make a lot of money off of this soybean. And BHT and BHA and all the other things that they add, red dye number 40 and all the other that they add to it. We can make a lot of them. It's better than getting cow meat. We'll just, we'll just sell this stuff and charge them $6 a burger and that's not what God wants. The evidence shows that ultra-processed food 
that it increases your chance of death by 62%. When you're eating, and most Americans, they eat ultra-processed all the time, and it's what shortens their life, but they don't reap it until they get into their 50s and 60s. Their joints start complaining, and they begin this downward spiral. Um, a study was done in Harlem where it found that this guy was working with, um, with um, heroin addicts in the 1980s. You can get a copy of this book online. It's a very short book, maybe 60 pages long. But this guy wrote a book called Diet, Crime, and Delinquency. He said that he found that these heroin addicts, they never ate a banana or, or a slice of wheat bread. They just ate garbage all day long. And he said, you know what? I think their garbage is what they can't get off of this heroin. And he found that, that the lack of just ordinary foods, that it worked almost like alcohol. It would unleash this crazy behavior that when you just eat junk food all the time, your behavior starts to just fray and unravel at the edges. And he found that high sugar, dairy, and mineral deficient food and food additives was a cocktail that just made people act crazy. And that's what people are eating today. I've gone out with Adventist kids. I've babysitted, and we have I've taken them to the store because I'm having them all day. I said, okay, I'll take you by Taco Bell, and what do you need at the store? And they're just, well, I got to have those, those flaming Cheetos. And I'm like, does your mother let you eat that? It's more dye than, than wheat. It's, it's bright red, and it's super hot. This is a little kid. Oh, yeah, mommy buys this for me all the time. I'm like, that's what your problem is. <laughs> that's why you're so messed up, my son. Let me pray with you. You're having issues because you're eating all of these things that are just not the best. And Alexander Schaus found that hyperactivity, aggression, and social behavior, it was directly linked to this mineral deficient, excessive milk, heavy sugar. When you eat a lot of sugar, it drives your blood sugar down, and it makes people act crazy. Now, does anybody here have a sweet tooth? Raise your hand now. Don't be ashamed. I got both of my hands up. Anybody here have a sweet tooth? That's why I love coming to these churches, man. These are some holy churches over here. <laughs> Godly churches. Most churches, you get half the church. Here we only got 25%. Maybe I should have you tap your foot next time. <laughs> well, that, that sweet tooth is a problem, you know. Um, and the Bible actually tells that you shouldn't eat too much sweets because the Bible says, eat thou honey. Praise God, you should have some sweets. But it says, it is, read these two words? Amen. To eat what? Much, much honey. And there's a lot of reasons for that. We don't just take a big old uh, bag of sugar and pour it in our mouth. We get our sugar through hidden sugar content. And um, it, it impairs your immune system. It's why we're getting all of these little infections. One more thing I'm going to talk about before I let you go, because I, I, I got a church, you know, a lot of you guys are health reformers. So I want to stretch some of your horizons a little bit. We've got to start getting our cardio. Quick question for you. How many muscles are there in the body? Franklin can't answer somebody else. How many muscles? No penalty for a wrong answer. Over here. 900. Over here, somebody. Take a guess. People don't want to be wrong in this church. <laughs> There's 650 muscles and how many joints? Now, here's a question. Why? Why did it give you so much money? 60% of your body weight is bone, muscle, and ligaments and tendons. He gave you that amount. Why? God designed you to move. And a lot of us are not as active as we need to. Seven days without exercise, what does it make? One week. It, makes, it makes one week. And you know, when children of Israel, they were in Egypt, they had this lifestyle there. They saw all these conveniences of Egypt, and they, were, um, they got their minds messed up with Egyptian worship, and they were eating Egyptian food, they had, and that resulted in Egyptian diseases, which was our scripture reading. And you know, when you go back and you look at the diseases that they had, the scab, the itch, which cannot be healed, astonishment of heart, here it is, mental health problems. There's so much Alzheimer's and, and dementia that's just sweeping across America. Do you know that dementia was hardly known 40, 40 years ago, but now you have whole institutions 
And it was because of that Egyptian lifestyle. They, the wonderful thing about the Egyptians were that they, they preserved their dead so that even today, thousands of years later, we can actually do autopsies on these body, bodies. And they're finding that they had the same diseases that we have today. They have infectious and also these chronic degenerative diseases. They have a lot of osteoarthritic joints. And they said it's because of the same factors the same lifestyle. And the promise was that if we do what? We're at the end now. Hold on. If we do what? If we hearken to the voice and, and give ear to his commandments. That's two things, brothers and sisters. That's two things God said. Not only keep those laws of hell, keep those commandments. He said, but to do what? Hearken to the what? We've got to become sensitive to when God's spirit is speaking to us. And he's saying, you need to calm down right now. Go for a walk. You're angry and you're about to say some mean things. And he says, he, he says, you don't need to eat right now. Or he says, you're eating too much. Push that away. You know how the wife will come and say, can you finish this? I won't put this in the refrigerator. What should you say? No, just go ahead and put it in the refrigerator. Thank you. I've had enough. Well, we say, oh, sure, baby, give me that. And we do that every meal before you know it. We're gaining too much weight. But the children of Israel had this problem. They had all of these diseases, and God says, I have a cure for you. I'm going to change your diet, and I'm going to cause you to walk. How far did they walk? Anybody remember? That's how long. The question was how far. And if they walk three miles a day, five days a week, for 40 years, they could have walked around the earth and then across North America. God says, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you with your diseases. You're going to walk away from these diseases. And I think they didn't like that at first, but it was the best thing for them. And we're in Egypt today. You and I, we need to walk, I won't say 31,000, but a few miles, anyway. At our church, we started a walking club. We said, we're going to walk across, we're going to walk around America. We tried to set out, we had 40 people, 30, 35 people, 30 walkers. And we said, in one year, we're going to walk as a church. We want to walk 5,000 miles. And I would stand at the back of the church every Sabbath with my little child. How many miles did you walk? How many? A mile? Praise God. And <laughs> how, many, how far did you walk? I did three miles. Praise God. We just, shh. And we only walked 3,000 miles, but there was, there was activity, there was planning, there was push to try to get these habits to change. What are these numbers? 2, 3.5, and 7. There's a number of hours of aerobic exercise necessary to maintain normal body. If you're not doing aerobic exercise two hours a week, when I say aerobic, that means you get out of breath then you, your body functions are not normal. Your liver function, your lung, your heart function, it is not normal. You are abnormal. What is 3.5 hours a week? That's 30 minutes a day. That's the minimum necessary to do what? Arrest and reverse these chronic degenerative diseases. And seven hours is how much you need to rapidly reverse chronic degenerative diseases. That's an hour a day. You could do 30 minutes in the morning. You go on the treadmill, stationary bike for 30 minutes. You will, or 30 minutes, it will reverse those diseases. If you're getting less than two hours a week, they have a name for you. That name is sedentary. And you have a whole constellation of health problems that go with that. And most of us here are sedentary. We are not even maintaining our normal function. When you exercise, many wonderful things happen. The blood rate picks up and it pumps it through the kidneys more times than it would normally do, and that cleans your blood, and our blood needs to be clean. You sweat, and that sweat has the same toxins that's in urine. It purifies your body. Which of these three is the worst thing that you could do? Which is worse? Sitting all day long, like a truck driver or a person on a computer, gaining some extra weight, or smoking? Which of those is worse? That's not all. They all sound pretty bad, doesn't it? Well, you know what's almost as bad as smoking? It's prolonged sitting. They've done studies that show that more than eight hours of no exercise poses the same risk as obesity and smoking. You can reverse it if you can get an hour 
of moderate exercise. If you sit eight hours, but you get an hour walk at the end of the day, it will undo some of that damage. But sitting, it shortens your hip flexors. It causes, all, it causes a head forward tilt. It causes all types of problems. Closing out, there's many other things we could have talked about, but I just want you to look at the screen for a moment because some of us in here, we need to write this down somewhere and say, Lord, I need to make this an issue of prayer. I need to get my physical strength where my mind can discriminate between right or wrong, choose the right, and then have strength of will to do it. And if you're taking a lot of fluid with your meals, if you're eating too much, if you're eating late at night, if you find that you're just eating like grazing like a cow, every hour you got a handful of nuts and popcorn here, an apple there, and your, your digestive tract never gets a chance to rest. When you get 50, 60, or 70 of doing that for, for several decades, that will cause a problem. You see, the issue of appetite, it's more than just your physical health. It's a way that God says, are you rebellious or are you obedient? When God rained manna from heaven, he says, I'm going to rain it down from heaven so that I may P-R-O-V-E. What is that word spell? That I might prove you whether you will walk in my commandments. Or no, when God says, this is what I want you to eat, he says, I want to test you. And in the Bible, proving is for the purpose of showing you the content of your heart. When I was coming up as a child, my father was a sugarholic. He drank soda like water. He was always eating pastry and candy. And as a child, I looked at him and I was like, mm, Dad, can I have some? He said, no, it's going to make you sick. But I watched for years. And when I grew up, I was addicted to sugar. Yes. I'll tell you one quick story. <laughs> you guys are going to be mad. I'm making you go over. One quick story. One minute. I hadn't eaten chocolate in years. And I went to my mother's house in California. I live in the Midwest. And when I got to her house, she had a big thing of chocolate kisses. I hadn't eaten chocolate in years. And every time I walked by, it was calling my name. <laughs> Sean, over here. But it got into my mind, and about 1 o'clock in the morning, I got out of the bed, and I said, what you say, I'll just have one. I sat there, looking at the news again, and ate almost half of that jar. And after I ate it, and I was getting ready to go to bed, I looked and I said, in the morning, everybody will know. So I went and got my keys, and I went to the grocery store at 2 in the morning. And when I got to the, to the line, there's a lady in there, you know, the grocery store, they got people working all night and stuff. And when I got to the line, here I am with this, this big bag of kisses, and she looked at me like, you got a problem. <laughs> you got a real problem. Let's see what time it is? And I came back, and I, and I, put, I put it all back in there. And when I got in the bed, God said, you have a problem that you need to deal with. There's someone in here. You got, you got something you need to be praying about this, this weekend. Some of you don't want to eat your vegetables. But if you destroy the house you live in, what's the last part of that question? The reaping years come later. And they aren't the best. That meat monster? It'll, it'll, it'll take you out. You're better off eating. What does it say here? Last night we talked about that red clover blossoms. You're better off eating flowers and grass than fat and blood. Here's the commitment time. Some of you need to commit to boosting how much fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables in your diet. Others of you need to say, you know what? I'm getting that, but I don't do any juicing. So you've got to make a commitment to get some juice, just a little bit three or four days a week. It's okay if you have to clean the juicer. It's okay. You need that juice. Some of you need to reduce or eliminate that red and white meat. Others need to, because I got, your, I got your, um, your, your surveys, and this church is doing better than most, but we're doing what most Adventist churches are doing. And some of you need to reduce and eliminate these high cholesterol, high fat dairy, it's time 
brothers and sisters, it's time to say, no more, God, I want to come up higher. Some of you are eating too much. You know, some of the most, the biggest overeaters, some of them are skinny people. Hear what I said? Some of the biggest overeaters are skinny people. Oh, it's not affecting me. It is. You're wearing out your digestive system. We need to push back. Some of you, you're doing some cardio, but you're not consistent. And I'm asking you to make a commitment this morning, this afternoon, to, to go up to 20 minutes a day. That's two hours a week. Or 30 minutes a day. That's three and a half hours per week. And it's got to be not a walk like this. You've got you to be out there to get your heart rate going. So who is the lion's preferred prey? Those that fall behind. Those that fall behind. And the good news is that though the lion is on our track, Jesus is also called a what? It says that he's a great lion. It says in Numbers chapter 24. And he promises that he can do what? Put his spirit within us and cause us to walk in his statutes. And in the last days, he's going to have some zebras that turn on the lion. They'll say, you know what, Lord, give me that lion spirit. I want to turn and do what you have to do. How many of you? want to make a decision this morning. You haven't got to tell anybody what that decision is, but you want to make a decision to make a, one or two changes in your life. Raise your hand. You want to make a decision. That's your desire. Bow your head, and I'm going to close out in prayer. Father in heaven, we've been sitting a long time, but we see that this health message is not just concerning our physical health. Oh, Lord, you want us to eat the right thing that we might have strength that will affect our mood, our temperament, and our disposition. That our words might be gentle and kind, that our actions might be unselfish and generous. And that this temperament